Let me give you a little bit of the background first, as I always do uh, when we start a new book study together. So I'm going to first talk just briefly about the book of 1 Timothy, and then we're going to talk briefly about Timothy himself. So here's a little background, and then we'll pray. But the book of 1 Timothy was written by Paul around 62 to 63 AD while he was in Macedonia, which is modern Greece. And it was written to Timothy. So, so sometimes people can read 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy and think that Timothy was the author. He was the recipient. Paul was the author. And Timothy was the pastor or overseer of the church in Ephesus, which is a city, still the ancient ruins are there in modern Turkey. And 1 Timothy begins a section of our Bibles referred to as the pastoral epistles. And that would be 1 Timothy, Titus, and 2 Timothy. Now, in your Bibles, it's 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. But I've given it to you in the order in which Paul actually wrote these letters. He wrote it 1 Timothy, then he wrote Titus, and then he wrote 2 Timothy. And when we go from our Bibles where we left off last time at the end of 2 Thessalonians to 1 Timothy, we're advancing about 10 years. First and Second Thessalonians, the books we just completed, were books that letters that Paul wrote early in his ministry. They were some of the first couple of letters that he wrote. And First and Second Timothy are the last letters that he wrote. And so we're, we're, we're leaving out a lot of what Paul wrote. Your Bibles, again, are not always given to us in chronological order, and this is such an example. We're going from First and Second Thessalonians, a couple of the letters he wrote at the beginning of his ministry, to First Timothy, Titus, and Second Timothy, letters that he wrote at the end of his ministry. Now, a little bit about Timothy himself as the pastor of this church here in Ephesus. He was from the city of Lystra, which is, again, a city in Turkey. The Bible tells us that his mother and grandmother were Jewish believers, but his father was a Greek. Now, in ancient Jewish tradition, and it still holds today, you are Jewish if you have a Jewish mother. It is not based on your, your father's lineage. It is based on your mother's lineage. And the reason why this became a common practice among Jewish families is because dads would often go, out, go off to war in ancient times, and if they didn't come home uh, because they perhaps died as a casualty of war, uh, then you would have a loss of your identity. So the identity stayed with the mother's side of the family. This makes Timothy fully Jewish, even though he had a Greek father, a non-Jewish father. He had a Jewish mother and a Jewish grandmother, and they were not simply Jewish by birth, they were also Christians by faith. The Bible talks about uh, his mother uh, Eunice and how she was a devout follower of Christ. And so uh, the wonderful part about Timothy's story is that he is another example of someone who has come to faith because of a godly mom or a godly grandma. And I can't tell you how many stories I've heard of people who who have come to faith in Christ because of a praying mom or a believing and praying grandmother, and Timothy is one such example. How many of you would say that in large part um, where you are in Christ is due to the influence of either a mother or a grandmother in your life? Let me see your hands. See, many of you can testify to that. Uh, guys, we need to step it up, but, but the fact is that many people have come to know Christ because of the godly influence and the uh, persistent prayers of a mom or a grandmother. Uh, the other thing to note about Timothy is that he's about 15 years of age when Paul comes to his hometown of Lystra on one of his missionary journeys and, and leads Timothy to Christ. And Acts chapter 16 gives us the background of it and tells us that as soon as Timothy is a believer, becomes a believer in Christ, he then follows Paul and he becomes a traveling companion of Paul's. And so this letter that Paul writes to Timothy is about, is about 15 years after Timothy has come to faith in Christ. So now you gotta add that to his age. He's about 30 years old now as he pastors this church here in Ephesus. But again, because of Paul's influence, he is basically a traveling companion and protege of Paul's. And he's named with Paul uh, in six of his epistles. 
as, as being a co-author. So he becomes very instrumental in Paul's ministry. He becomes mentored by Paul. Paul becomes a spiritual dad to him. As you'll notice, I gave you some examples of how Paul refers to him throughout his uh, different letters. For example, in Romans 16, 21, Paul refers to him as my fellow worker. And in 1 Corinthians 4, 17, he calls uh, Timothy my son whom I love. And here in 1 Timothy 1, we'll read it in a minute in verse 2, he calls him my true son in the faith. So again, Paul is not his biological dad, Paul is his spiritual dad, and Paul's influence is noted uh, in Timothy's life, and Timothy becomes a traveling companion and protege of Paul's. But we learn some things about Timothy in terms of personality and, and, and just his kind of makeup, and that is what Paul writes in 2 Timothy and in 1 Timothy here, that he appears to be someone who's pretty timid, fearful, and sickly. Uh, because Paul mentions in 2 Timothy 1.7 about how God has not given you the spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. And so he addresses some fear that Timothy has. And, and then, you know, here in 1 Timothy 5.23, this is, this is one of these verses that some of you love to quote to justify why you like to binge drink. But anyway, that's, that's that verse about, well, you know, take a little wine for your, for your ailments, you know, for your stomach. 1 Timothy 5, 20, 23, that's gotten a lot of traction among, you know, people who, anyway, uh, so that's, that's his counsel there because it was medicinal. It was medicinal. It was medicinal, all right? So unless, unless it's like medicine for you, you know, go easy on the bottle. But anyhow, uh, this is the background on the book of Timothy, and this is the background on Pastor Timothy himself. And, and I want to point out to you the key verse, before we even start reading here from chapter 1, the key verse that sets for us the main point of this entire letter, and you can turn there to chapter 3, but I've also put it up on the screen for you. Paul writes very sequentially here in 1 Timothy, and he gives us, he just spells it right out in the middle of this book. He says, here's, here's the main point for, for my writing, and it's chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. And Paul says this, although I hope to come to you soon, again, writing to Timothy, he says, I am writing you these instructions so that if I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. This is the main point and this is the purpose of his writing. The pastoral epistles, again, 1 Timothy, Titus, 2 Timothy, the pastoral epistles should be seen as a manual for the local church. This is God's instruction to us as somewhat of a handbook for how the church should operate and function. Now, if you grew up in a mainline denominational church like I did, every mainline denomination has a handbook that they call the discipline. And the discipline is basically, this is what we believe, this is why we believe it, this is how we function. Okay, well, God's, the discipline for the local church is basically 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. Because what we're going to find contained, and and just speaking for the moment about 1 Timothy, uh, what we're going to find contained here in this book are practical instructions for the church on matters of things, for example, of like orderly worship, on matters of prayer, on matters of the inspiration of Scripture and the importance of teaching it. And he's going to also talk about spiritual roles and differences between elders and deacons, between men and women in the local church. Seven times in 1 Timothy alone, Paul uses the word command. He tells Timothy, I want you to command these things. And I'll give you an example. If you go over to chapter 4, in chapter 4, for example, in verse 11, Paul says here to young Timothy, he says, command and teach these things. And then he adds it, verse 12, don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. 
So seven times he uses this word command. It is the Greek word paragelo, and it is a military term. It is, it is, Timothy, you set the tone for the troops in the church, and you command them these things, not as some belligerent dictator, but you urge them so strongly that these are non-negotiables, that there's an important need for the church to understand God's view about how the church should function and how people within the church should conduct themselves. This is not up for debate. God defines these things, and He lists for us the purpose of the church and how people within it should conduct themselves. We are not to try to improve upon it. We are not to try to alter it. We are not to try to redefine these things as our culture changes around us. You know, look, the, the church is not to be influenced by the changing times of the culture, but the church is to influence the changing culture. And, and we get it backwards. And so sadly, the church today in many respects not just, you know, speaking of ours, and I hope that we, you know, are conscious of these things, but unfortunately, in the larger sense, uh, the, the church has chosen um, different priorities and different views of God's Word that have been shaped in large part by the ever-changing culture. And, and I just, I want to make this clear that if you've been here at Cornerstone for any length of time, we, we are about substance over style. Amen. We are about truth over trends. Thank God. And we are about Christ over culture. Amen. Every time. That's what we're about. And I, I'm all about finding ways to stay relevant but I am also deeply concerned about the modern church making relevancy for the purpose of attracting people a higher priority than revelation for the purpose of glorifying God. In other words, we have to be asking ourselves, every church should be asking itself, are we more interested in gaining people than in glorifying God? And the way you can test that is whether or not the revelation of God's Word as the whole counsel of God is being taught and lived. I had a conversation with a lady a few weeks ago because every so often on a Sunday morning I will say to folks, hey listen, after service I'm going to be in the ministry room. If you're new to the church, I'd like a chance to meet you. I had an encounter with a lady a few weeks ago who was new to the church. She was visiting with a friend, and she came to the ministry room to meet me. And she said, I have to be honest with you, I told my friend when I found out how large your church was, I didn't want to go to a mega church. And she said, and this is, to be honest with you, I think that this is, um, this is not an unfair character characterization of some mega churches. She said, typically what I have found is that mega churches are all about trends and being edgy and being hipster and being all this and being all that, but lack solid biblical teaching. And she just said to me, I'm so grateful that when I came, I actually heard the Bible taught. And so that's what's important to us here. Um, I have never, I've never prayed for a large church. I've always just wanted God to be glorified. And as His Word goes forth, what, what does Isaiah tell us? That God will accomplish the purposes for which it goes forth because God's Word will not return void. And so, it will offend some and it will liberate others depending on how you respond to it. But my goal is not to worry about who it offends and who it liberates, but just to glorify God and allow God's Word to do its part in the hearts and lives of people. And so when Timothy here is receiving these instructions from Paul, Paul says seven times, I want you to command these things, command these things, command these things, so that the church of Jesus Christ can be healthy and so that people can understand God's view of how the church should conduct itself and how people within 
should conduct themselves. So that's where we're going over the next few weeks. So, you know, here's, here's your chances, I pray, if you're already offended, you can duck out and nobody will notice and we'll, you know, we won't take any offense, but um, let's pray and then we'll look here in the chapter one. Lord, thank you for this time now as we open up your word and we just pray that we would be the first to examine our own hearts and to look at our own church and not be more concerned about others or other churches, but just, Lord, that we would be faithful to your word and to the instructions from your word concerning your church. What are these things, Lord, that you would say to us? And how can we align ourselves with your instruction? So I thank you, Lord, for the sheep of your pasture here who are eager and hungry for your word and for truth. And I just thank you for that, Lord. And I pray that together we would just seek your face, read your word, and want to apply it to our lives, Lord. We understand that there's no perfect church, ourselves included, but we we strive always to do our best as we read your word and do what it says. And sometimes, Lord, we acknowledge that Some passages are easier than others, and some passages are challenging to us, Uh, but we accept the, the easy truth and the hard truth together, and we pray that we would be conformed more and more to the image of Christ, and that we would be made more and more into His likeness, that you would be glorified, Lord. And so we praise you and honor you and give you thanks tonight. It's in Jesus' name we pray, and everyone said, amen. 1 Timothy chapter 1, in verse 1, he he begins by telling us he's the author, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope. Notice how he talks about God our Savior, Christ Jesus our hope. Paul's writing at a time, by the way, when Caesar Nero demanded to be referred to as Savior. So Caesar Nero was to be called Caesar Nero Savior, and Paul makes this distinction. He says, even though Nero might be on the throne, God is the one who's really on the throne. And so he refers to God as our Savior, not Nero, and of Christ Jesus, our hope. Here's verse 2, to Timothy, my true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Lord. And then he warns here, starting in verse 3, as I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command, there's that word again, paragelo, so that you may command certain men not to teach false doctrines any longer, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. These promote controversies rather than God's work, which is by faith. So let's pause there for a moment. Now notice he's encouraging and urging uh, Timothy there in verse 3, stay there in Ephesus. Um, Look, I I can tell you, and some of these things, uh, as you read through 1 Timothy and Titus and 2 Timothy, these pastoral epistles, uh, you know, if, if you're not a pastor, some of these things, you know, may not make the personal impact that it does for you as it does for me. But what I get out of this first exhortation here is stay there in Ephesus because every pastor at some point wants to leave. Every pastor at some point wants to bail. Now, no disrespect to anybody in the room, but I can tell you personally in ministry that the greatest reward are God's people. I mean, that's just one of the most wonderful thing about ministry are are people and just the ability to interact with people and love people and, you know, lead people to Christ. So the greatest joys of ministry are people and the greatest discouragement of ministry are people. No disrespect, and present company excluded. I'm talking about everybody else in the church who isn't here tonight. But I'm just saying <laughs> that, you know, and you know how it is in your own life. I mean, you know, people can be joyful and wonderful to, to your, you know, enrichment, and they can also be challenging. And, and, uh, and so I just love the way Paul's like, just stay there in Ephesus, because apparently Timothy wanted to bail. He's like, I'm, I'm done. I'm out of here. No, just stay there. Stay there in Ephesus so that you may command, and then this is the first thing that he urges. Now, as we go through 1 Timothy, we're going to make a list of some things that the church should look like, some things that define the church. And the first thing that he tells us here is sound doctrine should be something that defines the church because his first warning is commanding certain men not to teach false doctrine. 
So apparently going through the church, and, and listen, this is, this is part of a pastor's job is to make sure that in, in different circles within the church, there's not false doctrine that is being taught. And so Paul says to Timothy, hey, listen, command, command certain men not to teach false doctrine. Now, it, it basically false doctrine comes from three things. You're either adding to Scripture, you're subtracting from Scripture, or you're denying Scripture altogether. Okay, so that's where false doctrine comes from. Now, you don't need to turn to Genesis chapter 3, but I'm going to give you an example of this kind of a thing that happens in the, one of the first conversations recorded in history is, is between Eve and Satan, who appears as a serpent uh, in the garden. And this is chapter 3 of Genesis, is, is the fall of man when, when Adam and Eve sin against, they rebel against God, and they end up, you know, taking the, the, the bait that Satan is, is giving to them about how God really isn't good and, and God's holding back on you, and so you ought to eat the fruit that he's told you not to eat. So they, they, they go for that, and then the, the fall of the human race. And so, you know, as a result now, we all are fallen because we all belong to the Adam's family. Family. And so, but that's just, that's just the way it is. But now, here's this conversation in chapter 3 of Genesis, and it says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God really say that you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Now that's not what God said at all. God actually said, You're free to eat from any of the trees of the garden, except one. Okay, now, God gives, lavishes his goodness upon Adam and Eve. You're, you're free to eat from any of the tree. Okay, that, that's a wide variety there. Just one, just one. Satan comes along and he, and, he, and he twists it, and he said, did God really say you must not eat from any of the tree of the garden? So Satan flips it and makes God out, to, God's a restrictive God. And God, God, God wants to take away your fun. He's a killjoy, and he just never wants you to have any excitement in life. And isn't that true, Eve? Now, when Eve actually responds to, to Satan, she says to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. Okay, now, careful, Eve, because words are important, and she's already subtracted a few words. She says, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, whereas God had said, you may freely eat from any of the trees. So she's already subtracted a few words. But God did say, Eve continues, you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. Now, question, if you know the story from the Genesis account, did God ever tell them they couldn't touch it? God never said you can't touch it. He just said you can't eat from it. For in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. So she adds and she subtracts from the word of God. She leaves out some words that God had said, like words like freely, and she uh, uh, subtracts in that sense, and then she adds words like, and, and you can't even touch it. And so therein lies the problem. You start messing and tampering with God's word by adding to it or subtracting to it, and and now you're leading into some false teaching. And it can just be a little word here and a little word there that can change the entire meaning of something. So we have to be very, very careful and true to the integrity of doctrine by not altering God's word, either by adding to it. And when you add to God's word, by the way, that's legalism. That's the problem with the Pharisees in Jesus' day because they did heap heavy loads on men's shoulders. Remember, Jesus rebuked them for that, because they took the Word of God and they made it a bigger burden than it was ever intended to be by by taking the law and adding to it all these various things to make it this burdensome thing. You know, for example, the strictness of, of, of of the religious sects, particularly the Pharisees in Jesus' day, took something like no work on the Sabbath, and they added to it things like, you can't even spit on the Sabbath. Because if you spit in the dry dirt, the spitball is likely to make a little path and that's considered plowing and that's against the law. And I'm not making this up. They would add things like that. They would add, you cannot on the Sabbath look in a mirror because you might see a gray hair. And if you see a gray hair, you might be tempted to pluck it, and if you did, that's considered harvesting on the Sabbath. They would add things like that to the law. They even would add to the law that if on the Sabbath you had your door open 
to try to catch maybe on a hot summer day a little breeze, if a, a deer, a gazelle, came running into your house because it got, you know, stray and lost and ended up coming like it's going to happen, but it comes into your house, the, the law that the Pharisees added on top of the law was you cannot shut your door because the moment you shut your door, you've trapped that animal and now it's hunting. And they would add things like that. Isn't that ridiculous? But that's a kind of legalism. That's why Jesus comes along and goes, you know, you do add heavy burden to men's shoulders. You know, you're, you're taking the law and you're making it a monster. The law was intended to point you to the Savior. Instead, you've just made it a bunch of rules and regulations. So adding to, subtracting from, or denying altogether God's word brings about false doctrine. The denial of God's word is basically the absence of it. See, sometimes people think that a church is not guilty of false doctrine if they don't teach anything wrong. But a church can be guilty of false doctrine if they don't teach God's Word at all. Because now they've just created this spiritual anemia and biblical illiteracy. And so you have denied the truth of God by not giving the full counsel of God's word, and that can lead to false doctrine. So that's one of the first things here that Paul says to Timothy. You need to command certain men not to teach false doctrines any longer, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. The endless genealogies thing is probably a reference to the fact that a lot of times uh, Jewish people took pride in their genealogy instead of seeing their need for a savior, that they had their assurance of their salvation, that they were good to go because of where they descended from or from whom they came. And so he says that's part of false doctrine too. Don't, don't let them think that. And these promote controversies rather than God's work, which is by faith. Verse 5, he says, the goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart. Underline these three things, pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. That's, a, that's an important thing for all of us to strive after, having a pure heart, having a good conscience, and having a sincere faith. Now, I just want to take a moment to point out that middle term there, a good conscience, because this is something that Timothy is going to focus on a lot. Timothy in this, uh, sorry, Paul focuses on, in his letter to Timothy, Paul mentions three different types of conscience. He's going to talk throughout 1 Timothy here about a good conscience. That's here in chapter 1, verses 5. He repeats it again in verse 19. He's going to talk about a seared conscience, uh, sorry, a clear conscience in chapter 3, verse 9. And then lastly, he's going to talk about a seared conscience in chapter 4, verse 2, which is, by the way, the worst. You don't want to have a seared conscience because a seared conscience is when you are numb to what is right and wrong. Psychologists today call someone with a seared conscience a sociopath. It's when you have no sense of what is right or what is wrong. And by the way, psychologists estimate that between 1 to 4% of the population are sociopaths. That means in the United States alone, there are an estimated 3 to 12 million sociopaths. People have no conscience. People who do things, and you know, th these are the people who are, you know, mass murderers and, and commit some of the worst of the crimes because they have no conscience. And that's the worst place to be, a seared conscience. And some things can contribute to that. Some things, you know, in, in just what they've come to understand about some people who are sociopaths, there are some things perhaps in their childhood that causes, you know, their conscience to become hijacked. Or it can just be the complete denial of your conscience over and over and over and over again, dismissing what you know is right or wrong and to the place where you become just completely seared and just numb about anything related to right or wrong. Now, practically speaking in our culture, okay, just, just for the moment, not speaking biblically, just speaking in terms of the way the culture talks about conscience, that's, that's when the culture refers to the good angel and, and the bad angel on your shoulders. Right, and so which one are you gonna to listen to? Because as a Christian, you see, my moral reference point is now the Holy Spirit. And God's Spirit now convicts me of those things that are wrong and guides me into all truth. But even without being a Christian, everybody understands, right? We're all created in the image and likeness of God. 
Your spirit is not regenerated until you come into a personal relationship with Jesus, but all of us are created in the image and likeness of God, which means he's given us the God capacity to understand intuitively right from wrong. That's why a little child instinctively knows when they do something bad that it's bad and nobody has to tell them because there's this conscience within each of us that is this moral compass. But if over long periods of time you deny and you dismiss those things that you're convicted about, you'll get to the place where eventually you just have a seared conscience. It's like anybody who's ever worked hard with your hands, you look at a carpenter and, and, and because you know, they're always swinging a hammer or they're always working with a tool or something, and they've got calluses on the inside of their hands, and those are places where there's been constant friction, 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 until the place where now they have these spots of their hands where they're numb, and you can't even feel. The, the, the sensory nerves are damaged now because they become calloused, okay? That's the way a person's conscience can become when over a long, long period of time, you just keep dismissing, dismissing. I know this is wrong, but I don't really care. I know it's wrong, but I don't really care. I don't know it's wrong, but I don't really care. And that's the worst place to be because it leads to a seared conscience. In the Greek, the word for conscience is sunidesis, and it's from two Greek words, soon, meaning with or together, and edo, meaning to see, and by, by implication, to know. Like when somebody, it's not visual sight, but it's like a conscious awareness. Like, oh, I see, oh, I know. That's this word in the Greek. And Vine's dictionary uh, tells us that conscience, pseudodesis, means a co-knowledge with oneself and God. So it is, it is soon ido. It is knowing with or seeing with God. It is agreeing with what God says is right or wrong and having a co-knowledge of oneself and God. It's a self-awareness of what is right and wrong because that moral compass that God has given us is active. And when we deny it or resist it or dismiss it, that's what can lead to a seared conscience. And because it's eight o'clock and I promised that you'd be able to be fed physically as well as spiritually. This is where we'll close and pick it up. Did not a half hour go by like that? Wow, all right. Well, I'd rather you leave hungry than feeling bloated. Like, can you get me out of here, please? So we'll come back for more read ahead, but that's where we'll leave off for tonight. And now we'll go enjoy a time of fellowship. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for this time, Lord, as brief as it has felt, but we just thank you for this opening introduction to the book of 1 Timothy. We pray that as we meditate on these things, you will help us to grow, and Lord, you will help us to be challenged in these things. And we pray, Lord, that we would be true to doctrine, and we pray, Lord, that we would be men and women with a good conscience and a clear conscience. And Lord, help us not to just dismiss that still small voice of your spirit whenever you remind us of what is right and wrong, lest we have a seared conscience. And so God, we thank you for this time in your word. We pray as we leave here tonight, we'll just apply these things to our hearts. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for your goodness and your grace toward us. In Jesus' name we pray. Everyone said, amen.